Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pack. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, where we take a look at the writings of the church. I just want to mention that today is the Feast of St. Marin. Some of you saw the Mass earlier today. I celebrated the Maronite Corbono, uh, part of which is in Aramaic. And one of my reasons, of course, it's the Feast of St. Marin, the founder of the Maronite Order. But another reason I want to do that, to remind us that it's the Christians all of these ancient traditions who are being persecuted now. They're being martyred now. Uh, the, in, some in Lebanon, uh, much more so in Syria and Iraq and a few other places as well. And it's important for us to remind ourselves this is still a living tradition. It's not a dead museum piece. This is the faith and practice of the Christians of the Middle East. And they are right now bearing the brunt of persecution, not at all unlike the way the Christians of Russia and Eastern Europe had borne the brunt of atheistic communism and its horrendous persecution. And so we need to keep them in our prayers and join with them as St. John Paul had said, as the other lung of the church. All right, we are getting back to our encyclical which is Veritati Splendor. If you want a paperback copy of this encyclical, you can go to EWTN's Religious Catalog. The website is EWTNRC.com or you can call them 1-800-854-6316. If you prefer, you can download a free electronic copy of Veritati Splendor and our document library, go to the main website, ewtn.com. You'll see libraries up at the top. Click that. Click document library and then type in Veritati Splendor and you can download that and every other encyclical written by popes over the last couple hundred years, um, about the last 300 years, all those are right in there. Now, of course, we want you to be involved and participate in our show. You can do like these nice folks have done. Come all the way uh, here to beautiful Irondale, Alabama, right next door to Birmingham. Or you can send a question by email, writing to threshold at ewtn.com. Or call us during our live broadcast on Tuesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And the number you can call in North America is one 800-221-9460. Or if you prefer, if you're outside of North America or live here in Birmingham, call 205-271-2980. We left off last week in paragraph 67, and we were talking about this issue for the last few weeks of what's called the fundamental option, where some people try to say that you make a basic choice and the specific behaviors that you do are not as important as that core choice. You make that fundamental option for God and specific actions are not so important. And I've been comparing it to the way a husband and wife make a fundamental option. You are my uh, spouse and I love you. But if in that relationship you say, oh, I'm committed to you and I love you, I am dating somebody else w during our marriage. I, I, but you know that I love you. And those specific actions with that other woman don't matter to me at all. Yeah, right. Your wife will say, oh, yes, I understand. As mu about as much as God's going to understand, you say, oh, yeah, I really basically love you, but I want to commit these mortal sins. That's the parallel, and that's a good way to think about it. So we continue on from that basic uh, point that he makes. Right? When he says here in paragraph 67.2, judgments about morality cannot be made without taking into consider 
consideration whether or not the deliberate choice of a specific kind of behavior is in conformity with the dignity and integral vocation of the human person. So, let's, he always used these fancy terminology, and it's rich, so we don't mind it, but we've got to you know, deal and bring that down a bit. He's saying that you can't judge a matter as being moral or immoral, and judge we must. Don't give me this, oh, Jesus said judge not. No, he said judge not the souls of individuals. You can't judge their person, but you can make good judgments, and you need to make good judgments about behavior and say this action is sinful or virtuous. So we have to make those judgments. But you make those judgments by considering whether the specific behavior is in line with human dignity and the integral vocation of every human person. Now, it's very important to remember the starting point for Pope St. John Paul and for all of us ought to be we are created in the image and likeness of God. And our dignity, like our other basic rights, liberty, pursuit of happiness, and life, those basic rights are given to us, given to each individual directly by God, who created us in his image and likeness. And therefore, moral behavior has to be consistent with being made in the image and likeness of God. I want you to think about this as we go through this election cycle because a lot of times we are going to hear people amp up their rhetoric in order to sound tough or to sound cool or whatever. And they will use vulnerable people as ways to step on top of them to get to their high position. Classic example, the other day, Mr. Trump saying that he would not only do water, waterboarding, but he would go worse with torture. This is not consistent with the dignity of the person, even the dignity of our enemies. Yes, there are enemies. Yes, they want to hurt us. And yes, they do hurt. He said, well, as if he justifies this by saying, well, they're cutting the heads off of people. Yes, they are. But that does not justify us attacking their dignity. We, they are attacking human dignity. But if we allow their behavior to draw us down to their level, they've really won. They've won. And then to add, uh, when he's told, well, this is not legal. As a matter of fact, anybody in, in the military knows it is against the field manual to torture prisoners. It's against the law. It's against the Geneva Conventions. And for him then to say, well, I'll just change it. No, then you attack our dignity by trying to establish yourself as a dictator. We don't elect dictators. We elect presidents who are subject to the law. The law of God and the Constitution. And we have to say the same thing. You know, when uh, Secretary Clinton and Senator Sanders insist on abortion. We have to say that is also an attack on human dignity because those children have an inherent dignity even though they are still in the womb and you cannot see it without the help of special kind of devices. That's why I was uh, amazed. It was a, uh, there was a stupid commercial about some potato chip or something and this baby gets born. What was the objection 
that was raised by NARAL, the, the National Action for Abortion Rights or something, the National Abortion Rights Action League. I think that's what NARAL stands for. What was their reaction? You cannot humanize a fetus. Well, what are you going to do to it? Make it a monkey? What do you think is in there? And they, now I didn't think the ad was particularly good about human dignity, but their comment, their negative reaction that they are so offended. We have to defend human dignity at every moment of life. And this is something that all of us have to be alert to. When we are making decisions about voting, we must take this into consideration. How are these people acting in regard to the law of God and the law of the nation? So we go on. Every choice always implies a reference by the deliberate will to the goods and evils indicated by natural law as goods to be pursued and as evils to be avoided. So we're not even talking about them obeying Catholic law. Well, Mrs. Clinton's not a Catholic. And Mr. Sanders is not a Catholic. Mr. Trump is not a Catholic. What are you trying to get him to follow Catholic law for? It's not Catholic law. It is natural law that applies to everybody who has a conscience that you don't attack human dignity. You recognize the dignity and you cherish it, including in enemies as well as in the unborn, as well as with the aged and the ill and debilitated. Everybody has inherent dignity. So you deliberately choose to seek the goods you are supposed to pursue and to avoid evils. This is our task in life. Now, there are positive moral precepts. Okay. There are some, for instance, there are some moral laws or precepts that are positive, saying this is what you ought to do. You ought to be prudent. You ought to be just. You ought to be uh, you know, uh, humble instead of arrogant, and a lot of other things that we ought to do. Right? What we can do with those is use the virtue of prudence, which tries to think through the correct application of a law in a particular situation. So, for instance, we should be kind to our children, but there are times when prudence tells a parent that you don't let the child get away with beating up his siblings or taking her sibling's stuff or somebody else's stuff. You have to let them know to be, you have to be harsh at times. And that is going to be a, a use of prudence. And that's why parents are so important in the raising of their children. They live with the kids. They know them. And they know when it's time to be prudent and harsh, when it's time to be prudent and merciful. And where these two things come together. And you, you understand, and that's where you apply those virtues in specific situations. Um, for instance, we also might have certain duties. We have a duty to help the poor. But we also have a duty to make sure that our own children are fed and housed. And prudence helps you to figure out how much I can be generous to the poor and how much I must refrain to make sure that the children who are in my specific care need to have certain things. Do they have to have the most fancy 
clothes that there are in the store? N presumably not. So you don't have to buy the most fancy things, but you do have to close them, and that may take priority over other work for the poor. You have to use prudence to figure out what's the best balance. And we oftentimes learn that by making mistakes as well. You know, people do go overboard one way or the other. That's part of life, and we learn from that. That's, that's not immoral to, to learn to be prudent about balancing our various duties. But when it comes to the negative, so that's about the positive virtues and positive laws. When it comes to the negative laws, we have something else. What do you mean by negative laws? Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not bear false witness. These are the things that are the negative moral precepts that prohibit certain concrete actions or certain kinds of behaviors as intrinsically evil. It is intrinsically evil to lie about somebody in court by which they end up going to prison because of your deception. It's intrinsically evil. Murdering the innocent is intrinsically evil. Committing adultery is intrinsically evil. You've given your word to your spouse. It is an intrinsic evil. Not something for the gossip columns to say, oh, did you see? Well, at least she was pretty. No, that has nothing to do with the evil of the deed. And this is something that we have to keep in mind about these uh, uh, negative moral precepts that pr prohibit certain concrete actions or behaviors as intrinsically evil. Those kind of negative commandments do not allow for any legitimate exception. Yes, you can commit adultery when you really like the person. No, no, you may not. You can steal something if it would really look good on you. No, you can't steal it. Well, if I have a baby now, it'll mess up my career. It'd be okay for me to kill my child in the womb. No, it would not. The life of the child has a greater dignity than any career. Well, that's not fair. What do you mean it's not fair? Would you kill an adult that got to promote, that if you don't kill them, they'll get the promotion that you want. Would that be okay? Presumably not. Well, if you wouldn't kill a competitor for a certain job, why would you kill a completely innocent child in a womb who didn't do anything, never even talked about you yet? They don't know how, but they, they might later on, but they don't now. No, it's intrinsically evil. And there's no legitimate exception. And this is where I've, I've heard some of the uh, candidates saying on the Republican side, well, in the case of rape or incest, no. Rape and incest are horrendous crimes and great, grave evil. But you don't cut the innocent baby apart because of what somebody else did wrong. You can't do that. You wouldn't do it to the perpetrator. You wouldn't cut his arms and legs off. You don't do it to the baby. That's not legitimate. Maybe legitimized by certain people in our culture, but it is not something that the commandments of God legitimize. And we must evaluate our own behavior and the governmental proposals by people who say that they want to make legitimate which is not, that which is not legitimate. The negative moral commandments do not leave room in any morally acceptable, acceptable way for creativity. He puts that in quotation marks. Being creative with the law of any contrary determination, whatever. In other words, there are people, sometimes there are people who know the law 
so well. They can talk anybody into almost anything. Well, if you use this principle and this principle and this principle, and this principle well, it, it, I urge you to go online and draw down, you can, you can get on, offline, the uh, case of Griswold versus Connecticut back in the 1960s. That's where the Supreme Court justices invented the right to privacy in Griswold. What do they say it is? The right to privacy is found in the penumbra of the emanations of the rights found in the Bill of Rights. What are they talking about? Think about this. What are emanations? If you've ever been behind a horse or a cow, you'll see emanations. And it's in the shadow of those emanations that they think they find the right to privacy. And that's about as worthwhile as that statement is. Probably less because at least the other way, horses and cows provide a lot of good fertilizer. But this is something that you can say that there's a right to privacy and from that go all the way as the decade, as the next 20 years or so win, next 30 years, from Griswold, you go to the case of Casey versus Pennsylvania, in which even the father of the child in that womb has nothing to say about the life of that child under the law. Now, this is what they would call creative. Mm -hmm. Once the moral species of an action prohibited by universal rule, is concretely recognized, the only morally good act is that of obeying the moral law and of refraining from the action which it forbids. In other words, once you recognize something is wrong, you have to refrain from doing the wrong and obey the moral law of God. You shall not commit adultery or fornication, because that follows from it. And you, know, you, you shall not steal other people's stuff. This is something that is very important. He goes on in paragraph 68 with a pastoral consideration. According to the logic of people who are using fundamental option, an individual could by virtue of making a fundamental option, a basic choice, all right, honey, I love you, and I want to marry you, and, I, and that's my basic choice. An individual could remain faithful to God independently of whether or not his or her choices and acts are in conformity with specific moral norms or rules. Again, think of it in terms of something very concrete. You make the basic commitment to your wife, and it doesn't matter if you, know, you go kissing on somebody else or take them out to dinner, buy them the box of chocolates and the, the roses for Valentine's Day or whatever else. Doesn't, that doesn't matter. I'm committed to you, and I come home every week to you, honey, after I've been around these other places with these other women. No. No, no, no. That's something that he's saying you cannot make that a uh, uh, something that that basic choice take away the morality of the specific moral actions. By virtue of a primordial option for charity. So some people say, "Well, I, I'm a, I hear this all the time. I'm a loving person." That's what he mean by a primordial option for charity. I'm charitable. I love people. And I'm going to love them the way I feel like I should, but I love people. And that's my basic core choice. And that that individual could continue morally good, persevere in God's grace, and attain salvation, even if certain of his specific kinds of behavior were deliberately and gravely contrary to God's commandments as set forth by the church. So, for instance, I, 
you know, I'm so much in favor of women. Oh, I want them uh, to, to, you know, do really well. And if that means I should kill children when they don't feel ready for a child, then that's because I love them. That would be an example. You, make, you say they have a basic attitude toward love, but there's a child who will be cut to pieces because that child does not get included in the love. It's not that you should love women less. It's rather that love should expand to include that which is unseen, in this case, a child in the womb. Or, I, I love the poor, and I want to help them. So if I go and rob a bank and give the money to them, I'll be like Robin Hood. They might even make some movies about me. Probably not. Probably not. No, you can't steal their stuff, the, the, the stuff of other people, to even do a good thing. Just because you say you're loving. Important fact. Man does not suffer perdition. That is, you don't go to hell only by being unfaithful to that fundamental option. God didn't say, okay, I'll let slide all the stealing, the adultery, the prostitution, the pornography. I'll let you slide with the violence. Uh, You know, you go around killing people. You go around making money off the backs of the poor. So long as I know that you love poor people, it doesn't matter that you really made your billions by, you know, forcing young children in third world countries to work for you to make your billions. That that won't matter to God because I know you have a basic fundamental love for everybody. No. No, that's not going to fly. It has to be very concrete. And, um, you know, with your free will, so that you see in um, De Verbum from Vatican II, the, the uh, Constitution, De, Word of God, or Dei Verbum, paragraph 5, where it says, an obedience by which man commits his whole self freely to God, offering the full submission of intellect and will to God who reveals himself and freely assenting to the truth revealed by him. So that your commitment has to include that I'm going to obey God. Not to say, yes, I I have an intention of love. But I I, I don't feel that the laws of God really apply to me, do they? Uh, that's That's okay if I don't have to follow those laws of God. No, that's wrong. Not the right attitude. We have to obey what God reveals. With every freely committed mortal sin, a person offends God as the giver of the law, and as a result, becomes guilty with regard to the entire law. What does St. James say in James chapter 2, verse 8 and following? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, where it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you do well. So it's good to love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. For he who said, that is God, who said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. If you do not commit adultery but do kill, you have become a transgressor of the law. You cannot pick and choose which laws are more comfortable in your world. It's God's laws that make us comfortable in his world. And even if a person perseveres in faith after, say, committing murder, there are stories of, I, I mean, Actually, I know more than I can really say um, uh, from stories I know of people back in my hometown of Chicago. But there are people in the mob who knew the faith. For instance, it was a mob technique that if they didn't like you, 
They would kill you as you walked out of a house of prostitution or out of your girlfriend's house, making sure that you just committed a mortal sin, and they would make sure you went to hell. Now, they had faith in hell and in God's judgment, but that didn't make them virtuous. And then if they did like you, they would get you, bring a priest, let him hear your confession, then they'd kill you. No, yeah, yeah, you, you, you know the faith, you know the catechism, but you're still wrong. No, even if you pers persevere in faith, you lose sanctifying grace, charity, and eternal happiness. As the Council of Trent teaches, the grace of, uh, uh, of justification, once received, is lost not only by apostasy, by getting out of the faith, but by which faith itself is lost, but also by any other mortal sin. That's in the degree on justification from the Council of Trent, Session 6, Chapter 15. The received grace of justification is lost not only by infidelity, whereby even faith itself is lost, but also by any other mortal sin whatever, though faith may not be lost. Thus, defending the doctrine of the divine law, which excludes from the kingdom of God not only the unbelieving, but the faithful also who are fornicators, adulterers, effeminate, liars with mankind, people lie with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, railers, extortioners, and all others who commit deadly sins from which with the help of divine grace they can refrain, and account of which they are separated from the grace of Christ. That, by the way, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. You do those things. St. Paul wrote that to the Christian believers of Corinth and warned them that if you do those sins, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven draw your own conclusions about what you will inherit. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll come back in a couple of minutes with your questions, emails, and questions from our studio audience, so please stay with us. are ready for some of your questions. Let's start off with a call from Leo. Leo, where are you calling from? New York, Silver Creek, New York. Okay. Buffalo, you've been here, that is in the Buffalo. Buffalo, sure I've been up there. Nice ready? area, but a little chilly right now. So <laughs> what <laughs> So what can we do for you today, Leo? Well, I have two comments. I'll give you that more, most important one first, all right? Yep. Okay, now we, we all know, most of us know, that there are many enemies that are outside the church. Yep. But also, within the church, there's quite a few, too. The, mm -hmm. uh, with the Curia and others who are at odds with the Pope mm -hmm. and the Magisterium. Mm -hmm. And well, the truth must be told. So I was just wondering uh, what, what you could have to say about that. Um, you know, one of the things, Leo, that uh, when it comes to uh, something like that statement, I, Believe me, I've come across people who are inside the church but frequently deny the church's teaching and try to undermine it. As a matter of fact, there is a group called Catholics for Free Choice. These are Catholics that they stay inside the church, but they are trying to promote abortion. And they are funded by a multi-billionaire, George Soros, allegedly, that this is, uh, you know, so that they, they, they stay inside. Or I remember uh, there was a theologian uh, that uh, 
disagreed with the church on lots and lots of doctrines, and they asked her, well, why do you stay if you don't believe this? She said, well, that's where the Xerox machine is. What did she mean by that? She meant that if she left and joined a church that agreed with her positions on immorality, then nobody would pay any attention to her anymore because they already teach that. So she was not trying to, you know, uh, have her conscience satisfied and find a place where she, she, her conscience fit, but rather she was trying to undermine the priesthood. Matter of fact, uh, one of the quotes that uh, I remember reading from one of the women's ordination conferences way back, maybe in the 70s or 80s, is that, uh, uh, again, another theologian, a scripture scholar, had said, we want to get into the priesthood so that we can destroy all priesthood and patriarchy. So the, the, these are some of the ones I knew. And when I come across, and this is one of the things, Leo, you have to be very careful. I know these specific situations. And when the time, when it came up, I wrote about it and dealt with those specific circumstances in concrete ways. The danger, Leo, is that if we are too general, oh, yeah, there's some people inside the church. Well, that does nobody any good except to create suspicion. You have to make sure you find out specifically what, who are these people, what concretely do they say, Try to get quotes from them, as I mentioned I just did, uh, public quotes, in fact, um, and, uh, and then come up with the ways to answer it. That, that is a requirement of charity that we know specifically. If we are just general, we sow the, the seeds of uh, paranoia, and I don't want to do that, but when it comes to concrete doctrine that is being denied, then I want to stand up, respond to the specifics, and give the reasons to believe the truth about Christ. And that, Leo, is what I would recommend you do. Make sure that you get the concrete stuff and then come up with good responses. We have another question from our studio audience. Sir, where are you from? From Syracuse, New York. All right, so not that far away from the Buffalo area. Nope, we're al almost neighbors, really. Say almost, almost. Yeah. So what is your question? Well, with the national debates, I'm very concerned where many of the candidates are advocating a carpet bombing and extreme forms of yes. torture. Mm -hmm. uh, how does this coincide with natural law? He, great question. You know, when we hear somebody say, wow, well, just carpet bomb their cities. You know, there are women and children and other innocents. Yeah, but they don't care about women and children and innocents. They take and sell them into slavery. Yes, they do. But again, part of natural law is that I may not do to others what I don't want them to do to me. That's, that's a starting point. Secondly, when it comes to um, uh, uh, something like carpet bombing, you have to take a look, or, or any technique dealing with warfare. War, we, uh, I remember when the, the war, the, first, the second war in Iraq got going, um, you know, we were praying here that it not get going. Pope John Paul was urging leaders to, to put a stop to it. And it ended up being a horrendous kind of situation. And, uh, and then with all these problems, war is very, very nasty solution. It's, you know, and I especially hear that from talking to soldiers. They're the ones who know how bad it is. And I, I urge people to, you know, when we hear this stuff, take a look at some of the movies that are being made about the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq to see how 
horrendous it is. But if it does become necessary to go to war, then the rules for just war have to be there. Are, is there unjust aggression by the other person? That has to be asked, That's the first question. Secondly, will going to war save more lives than it kills? So you can't just say, and this is one of the things that ISIS is breaking these rules radically. You cannot just go shooting people up, hoping that you get a big battle or something. No, you, you can't do that. You, you have to make sure that it's a winnable war and that fewer casualties will be caused by the war than if there weren't a war. Thirdly, you also have to use just means. You cannot or you have to do your best to avoid killing non-combatants. This is something, as, again, a part of uh, natural law. And you know, uh, sometimes it, it doesn't get avoided. It's sometimes hard to avoid. But we have to be focused on making sure we do it. Some, I, I fear that some of these statements are being made in the, the face of what appears to be weakness perceived weakness by the United States, so you overcompensate by saying, well, we're going to be really, really tough. No, we're going to be just and temperate and prudent and think through these issues carefully to make sure that we really do help say, the, the people, the Yazidi people, the, um, some of the Shia and some of the Sunni, and, of course, the Christians and the Israelis. No, all of them have to be protected. Everybody's lives should be protected to the best of our ability. And we try to do what we can along thinking those issues through very carefully, not just slogans. We have Serena on. Hello, Serena. Hello, Father. Hi, where are you from? Middletown, New York. Oh, you know, I, the more you talk, the more I hear that. <laughs> 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 What's your question, dear? My sister asks, if God forgives all our sins, then why is there a judgment day? And I couldn't answer her, Father. Okay, first of all, how does God forgive our sins? By us going to confession. Yeah, and, and we, have to, we have to recognize that what we did was wrong, it was our fault, and ask God's forgiveness, right? Right. Now, the reason for the judgment is whether or not a person did that. Did they ask God's forgiveness? Now, see that's and that becomes one of the questions. Do you? Some people say, "Oh, God is all forgiving, so it doesn't matter. I don't need to go to confession for what I did wrong." You know, that's that sometimes happens. Another issue with the judgment is that there is still the temporary uh, punishment due to sin. So, for instance, there, uh, there's, uh, some people repent, and they really are sorry. I'm going to assume the, uh, no, authentic contrition. But sometimes it's imperfect contrition. Remember that, Serena? Imperfect contrition is that you confess your sins because you're afraid you're going to go to hell. Right? Now, that's not a bad start. It's a good start. Uh, I, I wish every single murderer to be was so afraid of going to hell that they didn't do it. I could live with that. So could their victims. Right? So, but that's not full conversion. And one aspect of the judgment will also deal with those elements in a person that are not yet fully recognized, judging whether or not they need to go to purgatory. Because, you know, for instance, some people committed a lot of sins of lust, but they still like to think back on the good old days when I committed lustful thoughts. Uh, a good example of that would be the, the theme of the Golden Girls television series. <laughs> it's old women thinking back on the good old days or present days of, of their sexual sins. No, you can't go to heaven and say, yeah, I'm sorry, but boy, that was sure a good time. No, 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 that has to be dealt with too, Bubba. Uh, and so 
That's why there's a judgment. And that every one of us, the other thing too, last element of this, God's judgment will be far more honest than our own judgment of our behavior. God knows our truest motives better than we know them ourselves. Again, anybody who's ever raised a four-year-old knows that the truth about who did what and when and where does not always come out at first. I didn't need any ice cream. It's smeared all over the face. And that's when you get a mirror and say, mm-hmm. Now, tell me again. <laughs> Sometimes we, God, we, we have to expect that God's going to do that with some, not just overtaking some ice cream. Might be some other issues, too. All right. Uh, I have a question here from Robert. Father, if a Catholic doesn't attend Mass and would rather stay home on Sunday, is this a mortal sin? Absolutely. Absolutely. This is a, a commandment. Uh, you know, we keep hold of the Sabbath. Now, it's interesting. Of all the commandments of God, in the Ten Commandments, all of them are repeated in the New Testament except keep holy the Sabbath. Why? Because Christ rose on Sunday and it gets transferred to Sunday. But keeping holy Sunday, that is still a requirement. Unless, and again, the church understands, there are good reasons. A parent with a sick child or a child with a sick parent or spouse who cannot be left unattended. You have to stay home. The, the church totally understands that. That's, that's just good sense. But um, if you have no reason to miss Mass, except I just want to stay home, believe me, from what I've heard, I don't, I don't play golf. I don't play golf. But, um, you know, I've heard from people that uh, those who go to the golf course instead of Mass on Sunday don't necessarily go shouting hallelujah all the time. All right. And then the last part, it says, second, I'm a Southern Baptist. Will I go to hell for not being Catholic? Robert, if in your conscience you have come to a point to believe that Catholicism is true, but you still don't become a Catholic, even though you believe it's true, yes, that could send you to hell. If, though, in your conscience. Say, I don't know. I don't think some aspects of the Catholic Church fit the Bible the way I understand the Bible. And until I can believe that this is what the Bible teaches, then you are following your conscience, and God will judge you on that. The only issue with following your conscience to remember is you are not following your feelings. Conscience is a function of thinking. It's not an emotional thing. It's, uh, well, I don't like the way the hymns the Catholics sing. No, no, no that's, that's not a good reason. Are the hymns true or not? That's a reason. But it just, well, I don't like the music. No, this is not American Bandstand. You know, you give it a, a seven. No, no, no. You, what, what you do is if, if you don't understand the Catholic Church to be the true church, then God will judge you by your conscience. Just always, always keep seeking the truth for the sake of the truth and for nothing else, and God will judge you on what you know of the truth. Okay? All right. Let us go over to George. George, where are you calling from? Uh, Charleston, South Carolina. Father. Oh, great, great. Good to have you. And what is your question? Well, uh, Father, I have a, a granddaughter who will soon be six, and uh, for some reason the parents just have not got that child baptized. Mm -hmm. And in talking with them, I, I've, I've always believed, I don't know whether I heard it or read it, that if a person was never baptized, they could never see the face of God. Yep. Is yep. that true or false? Well, here's, yeah, here's the, a couple things that have to make some um you know, distinctions here, of course. First of all, it's not the child's fault, is it? And one of the things I would ask the parents 
Are they, uh, and maybe you can, maybe you know this, are they teaching the child about the Christian faith and the Catholic faith? Do you know if they're doing that? My granddaughter was raised in the church, really. Right, but and is she teaching her children Catholic, Catholicism? That I honestly don't know, Father. See, that would be one of the things. You know, when they, if they married in a Catholic church, they took a vow before God to raise their children according to the teachings of Christ and his church. If that vow, that's the answer to God as to whether they keep that vow or not. It's not answering to me. It's not answering to God. And this is something they have to take as a serious responsibility. Another thing I would ask them, George, oftentimes bring this up. Are they teaching the child to speak English? Because I, what I hear from a lot of these folks, well, I don't want to impose my religion on the child. Well, <laughs> are you even going to church yourself? Because if you're not going to church, then you are imposing your non-church on that child. You're still imposing your religious views by not going to him and not letting him uh, know about the faith. But do you teach him English? What if the kid doesn't like English? What if he wants to speak the Deutsche Sprache? For, you, know, vielleicht. <laughs> you know, maybe he would like to speak Arabic. Uh, how do you know? Wait till he's 18 before you teach him a language. Now, that's idiotic. But it's also idiotic not to teach them the truth of God. And that's the issue here. So, now in terms of the child, you know... One of the ch things that you, you can do as a grandparent, a lot of your grandparents are out there, try to teach your kids to love Jesus. And even though they're not baptized, if you teach them to love Jesus and tell them the truth about Christ, then what you can do is help them to make an act of faith even before baptism. And they would then have a baptism of desire should something, God forbid, happen to them. And that's, you know, if they don't have any desire of Christ and they have no knowledge of him, yeah, the, the soul is put at great risk. And it'll be more the parents that are held responsible for that. I have another email here. Hi, Father Mitch. Thank you for your education on the New Age. Um, I, I've heard many say that the New Age will usher in the final Antichrist and that it is tied to the world apostasy and Christianity that's growing. Would you agree with that? God bless Dan. Uh, I don't know about the Antichrist. Um, there are lots of Antichrists, lots of them. Uh, Hitler was Antichrist. Stalin, Mao Zedong, these are even worse Antichrists because by, you know, compared to Hitler, uh, Hitler was an amateur. He killed 10 million people in concentration camps. Stalin killed 61.9 million of his own people. Mao Zedong killed at least 90 million of his own people. These are antichrists. But in terms of the final end times, remember a basic principle. The angels don't even know. They don't know. If they don't know, neither do I nor do I try to figure it out. My task is to be faithful to the tasks Christ gives me now. Knowing the names, dates, and places of the end times and the Antichrist and all that, that is a management issue, and God is management. I'm in sales. You can tell my daddy was a used car salesman. But it's true. We are here to preach the reasons to believe and give people that good news. Taking care of the end times, that'll be up to God. And we, don't, we should not even think about worrying about that stuff. Always go against the falsehood to the best of our ability. But our ability is going to be limited because now we have run out of time. May the Lord bless you and keep and cause his face to shine upon you and lead you in all of your, his ways, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Also, remember what I said at Mass this morning? 
Anyone who goes to a Maronite church today can get a plenary indulgence by saying a prayer for the Pope, our Father, Hail Mary, and glory be, and go to communion and confession within eight or ten days. Finally, we can bring this show to you because of you. So keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill, and we'll pay our bills too. Thank you, and God bless.